Guatemalan law enforcement forces have violently repressed the migrant caravan attempting to reach the United States. U.S. defense officials have raised concerns about an insider attack during President-elect Joe Biden's inauguration. The Director General of the World Health Organization has warned that the world is on the brink of a catastrophic failure if rich countries hoard COVID-19 vaccines. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is From the South. I'm Gladys Quesada. Guatemalan law enforcement forces violently repress the migrant caravan that intends to reach the United States. According to the latest reports by our correspondent in Honduras, Hilda Silverstrucci, there are several minors among the caravan members, mainly babies and toddlers, and some of them are suffering illness. Military personnel launch tear gas at the crowd to disperse them and to prevent them from reaching border crossing points. Our collaborator, Santiago Botón, has also offered other details regarding the situation. As Botón tweeted, the largest number of Hondurans and Salvadorans still remain at kilometer 177 of the highway, but in Chiquimula, Guatemala. This morning, security forces installed a second cordon at kilometer 137 in Zacapa, where a group of Hondurans managed to advance and evade the first barricade. In Panama, construction workers began protests to demand their inclusion in the social security negotiations that are being installed this Monday. The single union of construction workers began street mobilizations and marches throughout the country in order to demand that the sector will be included in the government agenda of the so-called National Dialogue on the Social Security Fund, which includes proposals on various social welfare rights. However, workers, organizations and other social sectors have expressed their rejection of their national meeting as they consider it to be exclusionary, adopting decisions behind the backs of the majority. This Monday, Venezuelan Attorney General Tarek William Saab offered statements regarding the arrest warrants issued against several citizens who were illegally named directors of the CITGO, the U.S.-based subsidiary of the Venezuelan oil company PDVSA of the previous National Assembly. The move meant to disappropriation by these figures of Venezuela's assets through the U.S. sanctions applied against the company. These former lawmakers, without having any authority to do so, announced the appointment of a senior member of the CITGO Board of Directors and on January the 8th they announced the appointment of a new president of the company. I repeat, these are only excuses to give continuity to the theft they have been carrying out. For this reason, on January the 11th, an arrest warrant was requested as well as security measures consisting of a prohibition on the scale of movable and immovable property the freezing and immobilization of accounts and search and seizure warrant consisting of a prohibition on the transfer of movable and immovable property, the blocking and freezing of accounts and the search warrant against the citizens Jose Ramon Pocaterra Esparza, illegally appointed as a member of the board of directors of CITGO, Andres Felipe Girigoyen Luna, illegally appointed as the new president of the board of directors of CITGO. Likewise, the Venezuelan Attorney General stressed that both citizens are charged with the crimes of conspiracy, usurpation of public authority, money laundering, criminal association and obstruction of justice. Both are charged with the crimes of conspiracy, usurpation of public authority, money laundering, criminal association and obstruction of justice. I must recall that the fact of proclaiming himself as the president and appointing a CIGGO board of directors undertaken by the unmentionable individual, today repudiated not only by the Venezuelan nation, but in absolute disrespute at the international level, along with his henchmen, has prevented the Republic from exercising an adequate defense against the lawsuit filed by Crystal X in a federal court of the United States. The authentic representatives of Venezuelan state were prevented from acting. 
And the Venezuelan government sent shipments of humanitarian aid to Brazil on Sunday to address the health crisis in that country. President of Venezuela, Nicolás Maduro Moros, said a convoy of trucks will transport at least 136,000 liters of oxygen to the Brazilian city of Manaus, amounting to at least 14,000 oxygen tanks. The convoy entered Brazil this Monday through the municipality of Pacaraima in the state of Roraima. The Venezuelan president urged the government of Jair Bolsonaro to address the demands of the Brazilian people and pointed out that solidarity is a key element in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. Brazil's public prosecutor's office has opened an investigation into Health Minister Eduardo Pazuelo's handling of the health crisis in the state of Amazonas. The prosecutor's office granted the minister a period of 15 days to deliver all documents and information concerning the compliance with established measures. The latest epidemiological report shows that since the beginning of the pandemic, the region has registered nearly 230,000 COVID-19 cases and over 6,100 fatalities. The state of Amazonas has seen the collapse of its health system due to the lack of oxygen in hospitals in the state capital of Manaus, while there is a record increase in admissions due to infections. At the same time, in Sao Paulo, the vaccination campaign against COVID-19 continues. In Colombia, the violence continues as a new massacre was confirmed on Sunday night in Cauca Department. Local authorities reported that armed men entered a sports complex and shot three young men in the neighborhood of El Recuerdo, in the city of Popayán, capital of Cauca Department. The incident is the fourth massacre in 2021. The National Security Warranties Commission plans to meet this Monday to address the acts of violence that are rocking the South American country. It is worth remembering that during 2020, there were more than 80 massacres in Colombia. Social organizations and the international community have denounced and rejected all these acts of violence. This Monday, the government of Bolivia declared a red alert in several departments of the country after heavy rains over the weekend affected more than 13,000 families. Bolivia's Civil Defense Deputy Minister Juan Calvimontes on Sunday reported that torrential rains unleashed flooding and infrastructure disasters in several urban and rural regions across the country. Floods caused by the heavy rainfall have led to the loss of multiple homes and crops in La Paz and Cochabamba. The authorities also announced that the storms caused the death of one person, as well as damages to some of the most important highways of the country. Rainstorms mainly hit the Cochabamba department, where the Duralit Canal overflowed, causing mobility difficulties for at least 400 families. U.S. defense officials say they are worried about an insider attack or another threat from service members involved in securing President-elect Joe Biden's inauguration. The threat is prompting the FBI to vet all of the 25,000 National Guard troops coming into Washington for the event. The massive undertaking reflects the extraordinary security concerns that have gripped the Capitol following the deadly January 6 riots at the U.S. Capitol by Trump's followers. The action also underscores fears that some of the very people assigned to protect the city over the next several days could present a threat to the incoming president and other VIPs in the attendance. Army Secretary Ryan McCarthy said Sunday of officials are conscious of the potential threat and warn comrades of be on the lookout for any problems within the ranks as the inauguration approaches. Foreign Ministry spokesperson Hua Xunyin said Monday China will sanction certain officials of the United States for their egregious behaviors on affairs related to the country's Taiwan region. In light of the wrongdoings of the U.S., China has decided to impose sanctions of the U.S. official in charge who have behaved badly on the Taiwan issue. The U.S. must immediately stop meddling in Hong Kong affair, immediately stop interfering in China's internal affairs under various pretexts and endangering China's national security and not going further and further down the wrong and dangerous path. So with the so-called fact sheet is just another list of lies concocted by the U.S. side, fully reflecting the attitude of the U.S. politician concern who put public safety aside for their own selfish interests, disregard life, defied science.
indulge in promoting conspiracy theories and nearly spread political viruses. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said Monday that Russia has no proof of opposition leader Alexei Navalny's poisoning from Western countries, except for Navalny's testimonies. Navalny says, Russian Federation and personally, President Vladimir Putin poisoned me. And this is perceived by the West without any rejection. But we have facts, and only in the form of all that Navalny testifies at interrogation of German law enforcement structures. Italy's Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte deplores the opening of a political crisis in the midst of the pandemic, while Italians have to face the fear of disease and the social malaise and fear for the future. All our energies should be focused on the country's crisis, while in the eyes of the citizens they seem to be dissipated by polemics, often sterile, totally incomprehensible to those who have to face the fear of disease every day, the specter of impoverishment, social malaise, the anguish of the future. Tedros Adhan Manjabriosus said Monday the world is on the brink of a catastrophic moral failure if rich countries hoard COVID-19 vaccine doses while the poorest suffer. Vaccines begin to be deployed. The promise of equitable access is at serious risk. More than 39 million doses of vaccine have now been administered in at least 49 higher income countries. Just 25 doses have been given in one lowest income country. Not 25 million, not 25,000, just 25. I need to be blunt. The world is on the brink of a catastrophic moral failure. And the price of this failure will be paid with lives and livelihoods in the world's poorest countries. Not only does this me-first approach leave the world's poorest and most vulnerable people at risk, it's also self-defeating. Ultimately, these actions will only prolong the pandemic prolong our pain. The restrictions needed to contain it and human and economic suffering. In the United States, at least 55 people have died after receiving the COVID-19 vaccines produced by Moderna and Pfizer-BioNTech pharmaceutical companies. According to data from the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, a number of patients died a few days after receiving these vaccines. Most of the disease were identified as people at risk because they were over 66 years old. In addition to the fatalities, authorities reported 96 life-threatening events following vaccination, as well as 225 admissions and nearly 1,400 visits to the ER. U.S. health authorities stated that the vaccine's side effects are being investigated, while insisting that despite these incidents, they continue to consider the vaccines to be safe. Belgium begins vaccinating health workers in hospitals against COVID-19. Leach Regional Hospital aims to vaccinate 200 health workers per day until all 3,500 health workers have been inoculated. First day of vaccination, we will vaccinate an average of 200 people each day and we start with the services most exposed to COVID, which are ICU, emergency and COVID hospitalization rooms. The vaccination reassures me because it was a product we hoped for for a long time. It is something that will allow us to work in a safe manner and it will also eradicate this pandemic we are fighting against for almost a year now. Germany's health minister said the country will step up its monitoring of coronavirus variants amid concern that some mutant version could spread faster or cause more serious illness promote the analysis of coronaviruses and to make the death analysis from such analysis mandatory 
to a central body, the Robert Koch Institute. As a general rule, at least 5% of all positive tests should be genome sequenced. The analysis of the coronavirus thus becomes an integral part of pandemic surveillance. These days, I keep reading that everyone is talking about the British or English virus. I think we didn't talk about the Chinese virus in the spring for good reasons. When presidents around the world talked about the foreign virus, we very consciously didn't go along with that. I think we should just talk about viruses that may have been discovered in the UK or in South Africa or now in Brazil, but this virus has no nationality and neither do the mutations. Several nations are reopening schools and other academic institutions despite the alarming figures of COVID-19 infections and new variants in order to receive pupils to warranty their education after months of closure because of the pandemic. For instance, Pakistan has started reopening schools in phases after about two months of closure despite a steady increase in infections and fatalities from the coronavirus. Authorities said in the first phase, classes from senior grade students will reopen, while junior class will be reopened from February 1st. Students also said they wanted to remain in school to study for upcoming examinations. Pakistan has reported 10,997 fatalities from the coronavirus, among 521,211 cases since February, when the first case was detected in the country. Pakistan's Drug Regulatory Authority has approved the use of Oxford AstraZeneca's COVID-19 vaccine and the government is trying to make it available for the first quarter of the year. We appeal to the government that they must reopen all education institutes so that we can continue education properly. Because due to the pandemic, we have already lost education. The students are coming here with blank minds. I think that the students did not get any learning through online courses. We are following all the standard operating procedures for the safety of children. Schools in Moscow also reopened Monday with pupils back to classes after months of studying remotely. Schools have been closed since October amid the spread of COVID-19. Special measures are being undertaken to minimize the spread of the virus inside the schools. Before entering classes, temperatures are measured. Breaks and other activities are organized at different times to avoid interaction between children. According to Moscow Major Sergei Sobyanin, if a single case is detected, the entire class will be forced to shift to online education. Universities, colleges and other education facilities will remain on remote learning until January 21st. Emotions are overwhelming. At last we met with children after such a long period. It's great. I even decided for myself that the first week I will not be strict. This will be an entry into the educational process. There will be elements of repetition. Also on Monday, Poland's youngest children returned to school for the first time in over two months, but most students will still remain in virtual classrooms. Poland has seen some of the longest school closures in Europe due to COVID-19, but many parents are concerned that children may be returning too soon. The government said it wants to bring more children back, but is starting with the youngest, and they are at least likely to be infected, and remote learning from them is least effective. Poland reported more than 3,200 COVID-19 cases and 52 fatalities in the last 24 hours. To date, the nation registers over 1.4 million infections and more than 33,000 fatalities. Everything has been organized to make sure that children wash their hands often and respect social distancing. Attendance is quite high. I think that today about 75% of the students came to school. That's what we predicted. Almost all third and first graders came, but there were fewer second graders. We are waiting, of course, for teachers to be vaccinated. In the meantime, we try to respect social distancing, which means we try not to get too close to students. But sometimes we also need to help students with their handbooks to correct something or explain something. Experts believe there are more cultural relics to be unearthed after a new trove of treasures was discovered at Egypt's Saqqara necropolis near the pyramids of Giza.
An Egyptian archaeological mission working on Saqqara announced on Sunday the discovery of the funerary temple of ancient Egyptian Queen Nate, wife and daughter of King Teddy, the first pharaoh of the sixth dynasty that ruled Egypt over 4,300 years ago. The finding introduces the name Queen Nate for the first time in ancient Egyptian history, as King Teddy was known before the discovery to have only two wives, Ibut the first and Kuit the second. The Saqqara archaeological site, a vast necropolis of the ancient Egyptian capital of Memphis, an UNESCO World Heritage Site, is located about 30 kilometers southwestward of Egypt's capital city, Cairo. About over 5,000 years ago, the capital city of ancient Egypt is Memphis, where a large area of cemetery lies westward, and the most important part area of the cemetery was Saqqara, where many royal family members, important officials and clergies were buried from the early dynasty period through the entire historical period of ancient Egypt, which included the Hellenistic and the Roman period. The craftsmen responsible for construction here in the ancient times needed to eat and drink, didn't they? They used plates to have meals and small cups to drink water. And when the construction project concluded, some of the gadgets as well as construction tools they used would be left behind, which would guide the digging like marks, because finding these marks usually indicates an existence of relics nearby. And we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesurienglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telesur English, I'm Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.